Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the first of our accidental travel trigger series. Um, today we have first encounters for travel vignettes. Um, we have um, historian, uh, professor, and journalist uh, David Mould, who is going to be taking us through a few um, shorter stories, um, kind of give us a, a sneak peek um, for the rest of the series. Um, he has um, traveled around the world and has published in journals. He's um, published for newspapers and a t has been a TV journalist. Um, so I'm very excited to hear his stories and very grateful that he's here to share his experiences as well. So David, um, thank you for joining us and welcome. Okay, Becky, well, thank you. I'm just going to share my screen here. I'll make sure everything's working here. Um, well, welcome everybody. And uh, as people started joining, I saw a few names I recognized there. So, um, John Brennan, Mike Sweeney, maybe some other people. Hi, glad you could join me. Um, so I, I, I want to begin by kind of explaining the title of this series and thank you to the Stores Library for kind of booking me through next um, April, I believe it is. Um, the Accidental Writer Travel Series. Um, the point here is that I, you know, I, I've never been a professional travel writer. I mean, nobody's employed me to do that directly. Um, my travel writing comes out of the fact that I've traveled, as you can see, pretty extensively over the last 25 years or so, uh, working as a teacher, a trainer, um, researcher and consultant, mostly for development agencies, recently for UNICEF. And as I travel around, I take notes about places, I strike up conversations with people. And this really all started actually in Central Asia 25 years ago, when I started sending emailed essays home to family and friends. And then a few years later, I, f I pulled all of these out and put them together and went, hmm, this may be worth publishing or maybe putting into articles with a little additional research. So it's been a kind of a serendipitous process here as I've traveled around. Um, but um, that's been the genesis for three books. Uh, the first, um, two of them from the Ohio University Press, the third from Open Books. The first is on Central Asia, and that's actually going to be the topic of my next presentation, November the 2nd, which I call Lost in Stanland. That's kind of a reference to the sort of geographical confusion that many people have about that part of the world. Oh, you've been in one of those stands, haven't you? Um, the second one, uh, Monsoon Postcards, which is really the sort of the genesis for tonight's presentation uh, on the Indian Ocean region. And most recently, the book came out last year, uh, um, postcards from the Borderlands, which takes uh, experiences of, of crossing borders, but borders broadly defined, not just physical borders, you know, in, uh, in on three continents. So, um, <coughs> traveling with me can be kind of tiring, especially if somebody wants to sleep, because I rarely do. I'm constantly scribbling down notes on whatever I have handy. It could be a notebook or an airline boarding card, a restaurant menu. And I write down what I see and what I learn as soon as I can, because really that's the only way I can connect the dots later. And I do find that in a place, even in a place filled with new sights, sounds, and smells, what is interesting on your first encounter, your first visit, is 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 most important because the next time you go back it will be more familiar and the third time even more familiar so uh, this is why i call this first encounters i've got four stories here which really talk about my first encounter with a place or with a country where i literally wrote down almost everything i saw now i'm not going to read everything I saw, but uh, uh, as I say, those first impressions of a new place, of a new situation are very important. Um, these are my kind of travel mantras. I, I, uh, I mean, I always loved reading Paul Theroux, and I think he summed it up pretty well. You've really got to 
go with the flow, travel slowly, you know, put up with all the hardships of travel. And then the very concise quote from another travel writer, Thomas Swick, travel's only interesting when things go wrong. Um, I actually got an email from somebody the other day say, recommending Viking cruises to me. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure they're perfectly fine. Some of you might have been on them as hassle-free travel. And I went, I don't like hassle-free travel because only when you encounter problems in travel is it actually worth writing about. So travel's only interesting when things go wrong because then you've got something to write about. If everything's perfect, nothing to write about. So we're going to start in India. Um, I've made eight or nine visits to India over the last 15 years to several regions. Uh, most recently, I was in Delhi, uh, the capital, in November, oh, November 2019. Um, I've learned a lot about the country, but also realized how little I know. And this is how the government of India, the hotels and the tour companies would like you to imagine the country and would love you to come back when you're able to travel again. So this is from a tourism campaign a few years ago, the incredible India tourism campaign. So, you know, there is that India and then there's this India. This is the India that I've experienced. It's incredible, also infuriating, and in some ways just inexplicable. I'm going to read a, uh, a short segment from Monsoon Postcards, which talks about how as a Westerner <coughs> I encounter India for the first time. It's easy to feel overwhelmed. You know the basic facts. India is the second most populous country in the world, 1.3 billion people. It's diverse in topography, ethnicity, language, religion, culture and cuisine. Nevertheless, after you've pushed your way past the hotel and taxi towns at the airport, shooed away the gaggle of young boys fighting to carry your bags and earn a few rupees and you settle into the air-conditioned comfort of the official car or the hotel shuttle, India still assails your senses. There's nothing that can prepare you for the crush of people, cars, auto rickshaws, handcarts, bicycles and people on the city streets. Street vendors hawking, and this is actually a list I made while stuck in a traffic jam, hawking snacks, newspapers, cheap toys, sunglasses, pens, pencils, balloons, coconut slices and mobile phone car chargers move among the stalled or slow moving vehicles. Your car passes rows of dilapidated concrete apartment blocks, their courtyards strewn with trash. Along the roadside and the railroad tracks, rough single room shanties, bamboo poles framing rusting sheets of metal, cardboard, tarpaulin and plastic. Outside, literally on the street, women are cooking on stoves or open fires and bathing their children. In parks, alleys and under bridges, those who do not have a shanty claim a few feet of grass or dirt for a sleeping space, laying out a blanket and a few possessions. Yet a few hundred yards further on is a residential compound of smart, high-rent apartments with an electronic security gate, a guard post and cameras. Your car passes modern office towers, ornate wedding palaces, brightly colored Hindu temples and white wall mosques and a moving window display of commercial signage, some in rather comic English. The malls are packed with shoppers. You arrive at your hotel surrounded by high brick walls topped with barbed wire and spikes. A hotel staff member opens the door and two more carry your bags. A doorman, this guy, looks like he stepped out of a military parade ground or a TV period drama. Six feet tall, well built, with a dark beard, resplendent in his turban and with his ornamental sword. Um, for an instant, you imagine you're back at the time of the Raj. This is the Taj Dekan in Hotel in Hyderabad, where I've stayed a few times. You're back, you're back in the time of the Raj. You're a British colonial officer with a small army of staff at your bidding. Then reality returns. You're in a modern hotel with air conditioning, Wi-Fi and room service. CNN is on the monitor. 
uh, the sound muted. The low level music you hear sounds familiar, but somehow it seems out of place. Then you catch the tune. Let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. Surreal. The dark suited desk clerk smiles and gives you your key. Welcome to the Taj, sir. I hope you have a pleasant stay. I mean, uh, I, you know, the, the term land of contrast is a terrible travel writing cliche, but in India, you are facing it every time, almost at every corner on every block. Okay, we're going to switch now and do a little tour of the Indian Ocean region, and we are going to go to Madagascar, um, and uh, the fourth largest island in the world, and to its capital, Antananarivo. Uh, there are a lot of syllables in the uh, in the Malagasy language, so most people <laughs> abbreviate it. Antananarivo is simply Tana. And um, this is from the street, um, from the airport to the, uh, you know, to the downtown area. And uh, after a few hotels and a Chinese casino, it's a typical African or Asian street scene. Honking cars, slow moving trucks, hole in the wall shops, children playing on the sidewalk, porters lounging on handcarts, and an absolutely mesmerizing display, or array rather, of small retail establishments crammed into narrow storefronts. And walls like this, um, there's a sign on this wall that says Defense d'affiche, it's forbidden to post, but of course nobody pays any attention to that. And this is plastered with uh, posters for music concerts, religious revivals, and political candidates. Uh, 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 Madagascar is a politically very unstable place, so they have lots of elections there. Um, situated about 4,000 feet above sea level, Tanna, with its hills and its narrow winding cobblestone streets, felt like a slightly rundown version of Paris surrounded by rice paddies. <coughs> and that's what I wrote down on my first visit. Paris with rice paddies. Large churches on top of the hills, those are the cities Montmartre, and down the slope you find colonial era hotels like the wonderful Hotel Colbert, and restaurants op offering astonishingly cheap French haute cuisine. Um, and in the lowland areas, broad boulevards and markets like this one. This is the Isutri Market in Tana. Um, uh, because it's built on hills, there's a kind of a residential geography to the place. So, and this has always been the case. So until the French arrived and colonized Madagascar in the late 19th century, uh, the monarchs, the Mariner monarchs, built their palaces on top of the hills and also the royal tombs. Um, down the slopes, the homes of the noble class, the commoners further down, and the slaves and the rural migrants lived on the plains. And today, you know, there's still that kind of contrast. The higher you go on the hill, you know, the more upscale it is when you get down to the lowlands, you find rough shanties like the photo on the right uh, represents there. Uh, official population of the metropolitan area is about 2 million, uh, which is about a tenth of the population of the country, but nobody really knows because there are unregistered migrants coming into the city literally every day. Madagascar, like many other countries in the developing world, has massive rural out-migration. And the French influence is still there. It's there in the language. I mean, French is still the language of commerce there. In the architecture of public buildings like this one, uh, there are bakers selling baguettes and croissants. Uh, on the restaurant menu, you can get escargot and pâté de foie gras. And the picture on two pictures on the right are of the, uh, the, rail, the, the railroad station, or the former railroad station. The railroad doesn't run anymore. Um, but this is a cafe there, the Café de la Gare, the railroad station, or the railway station. I mean, to me, it reminded me of a brasserie in a French provincial town, 
dark wood paneling and and chandeliers, you know, uh, white shirted wait waiters. Madagascar's got a kind of ambivalent relationship with its former colonial master. The French brought law and order, roads and railways, a health system, and nice restaurants, good haute cuisine, but they also forced people basically to be indentured laborers and work on the land. France is still the leading foreign investor, though China is catching up and French tourists bring in a lot of much needed foreign exchange. France is still seen as a place to receive higher education, maybe to migrate for work. And then there are the cars. Okay. Uh, I don't know if any of these are familiar to you, um, but uh, as I put it, the history of the French automobile industry lives and breathes, or maybe wheezes would be a better verb to use in Madagascar. So this is the Renault Catrell, um, introduced in 1961, aimed at the lower end of the market, kind of like the Volkswagen in Germany. Um, and, um, you know, it, it, it rivaled the, well, the one that we'll see next, the uh, uh, Citroën de Chevaux, the 2CV, um, uh, front wheel drive saloon. Uh, both of these cars were seriously underpowered. I, I actually used to own one of these when I lived in Britain. Um, so you could get up to about 50 miles an hour, but rather slowly. Uh, but then it sort of chugged along very happily, just two cylinders, didn't use a lot of gas there. Um, now, I, I visit my sister who lives in France. Uh, mm, well, it's been a few years now. I was planning to visit last year. And it's kind of unusual to see one of these cars, a De Chabot or a 4L, on the roads there. Uh, a few rusting in barns. A few have been lovingly restored. But these are still the most common taxis on the roads of not, not only Tanna, but other towns and cities in Madagascar. And most of the survivors of the traffic wars, they got battered panels out of whack alignment. Uh, on some, the ignition no longer works, so the driver reaches down and hot wires it to start the engine. And as you rattle up the cobblestone streets, you try to forget there's almost no suspension. You just marvel the cars still running. Um, so, I mean, that was kind of my question, you know, um, these went out of production, you know, almost 30 years ago. How do they keep them running? It's a little bit like the story of the uh, of American cars in Cuba, in Havana. So the French word is bricolage, uh, which kind of literally means to tinker. The uh, bricoler is to tinker. If you go, if you're in France and you go to the equivalent of a Lowe's or a Home Depot, it's called the bricol. Um, so, you know, parts for these cars are no longer available, and you know they'll all be kind of as they break down or fall apart. You know parts will be salvaged. There's a big used parts industry there or used parts um, market there. But, you know, um, you can't fix all of the cars with that. So there's a little ingenuity here. The auto parts stores um, are controlled by Indian and Pakistani shopkeepers and they import spare parts from India and Pakistan, um, Mumbai, Karachi, uh, for Indian-made cars for Tatas and Mahindras and other Indian-made cars. And some of them will fit these cars, but, you know, even if they don't, what you can do is you can take a part and you go to one of the many metal fabrication shops uh, that are all around the city and say, hey, you know, can you make this work for my De Chavot or my Catrell? And they'll do it. And if it doesn't work, they'll just make you a new part. Um, I mean, recycling, and reuse is, you know, absolutely part of uh, Malagasy culture, uh, not out of any particular environmental awareness, but because it's a very poor country, that's what people have to do. Okay, we're going to travel northeast across the 
um, Indian Ocean to Bangladesh. Uh, this is the country I last visited before COVID shut down my travel. I was there in February 2020 for about three weeks. Uh, I think my seventh visit to the country on a project for about uh, in about a three year period. So um, Bangladesh, I, I, I don't have time to go into the history here, but this is the former East Pakistan um, carved out of India at partition in 1947. Uh, it became independent in the Liberation War in 1971. As a, it's a very small country, um, but as you see, the population is about half that of the United States pretty crowded place, also subject to a lot of floods. So these are scenes, and I've seen scenes like them, uh, from the capital, Dakar. Um, Dakar is one of the most densely populated areas in the world. The population of the city itself estimated at 8.5 million. That of the metropolitan area, all of the towns around it, where all those textile factories are, um, estimated at more than 20 million. And more people are arriving every day. Although some migration is seasonal, um, farmers working construction or pulling rickshaws in the months between seed time and harvest, an increasing number of rural migrants um, stay because that's the only option they have. Um, uh, there are an increasing number of climate refugees. What's happening here is that brackish salty water from the Bay of Bengal is washing into coastal areas. And so um, you can't cultivate rice, which is a staple of the diet there, in salt water. You need fresh water. So land that once was able to be cultivated for rice has now become uncultivable. I can't say that word. <laughs> um, and farmers are, and their families are being driven into the cities. So um, Dhaka, like most South and Southeast Asian city, is notorious for traffic styles. And there's a sort of kind of, I say, a beauty contest going on between, you know, people who travel to these cities. No, 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 Bangkok is worse than Delhi. No, Jakarta is worse than all of them there. Um, but anyway, here's the World Bank analysis for what it's worth here. Um, average traffic speed dropping to five miles an hour over a decade. And if this goes on at the current rate, three miles an hour, at which point it would make more sense for people to get out of their cars and actually walk. But um, I'm not betting that's going to happen. But you sort of kind of see the economic impact there, the number of work hours per day that are eaten up. And I've spent quite a I mean, I, I, I spent so, you know, up to a week in Dakar and it's like, well, oh, you know, I always take work in the car because I'm going to need to do that. I'm going to be stuck in traffic, you know. Um, so, um, and this is, you know, important because this is a leading city here. Um, um, Dakar is estimated to contribute one third of the country's gross domestic product, about 40% of total, un, total employment. And these are some of the buses on the road, as seen better days. Um, um, they, they're scraped and have uh, uh, been victims of, the, um, victims of the traffic wars there. Um, lane discipline is not part of the culture. My colleague Yasmin Khan, as we were driving, pointed to some traffic lights, which nobody <laughs> was about. She said, they put them there, but they're mere roadside decorations of traffic lights. Um, so, um, the best way to get around is probably in one of these, you've probably seen these before, uh, the auto rickshaw. Um, I guess the one slight bonus here, given the terrible pollution levels in Dakar, is that these are uh, 
these are powered by compressed natural gas, so they're, they're commonly known as CNGs. And, uh, you know, they, they can, they're kind of dangerous. They can weave in between the traffic so they can move a little faster than, than cars or buses. And um, there's a narrow bench seat. It can accommodate three or four Bangladeshis, or if we're talking well-fed Westerners like myself, probably two. Um, you're not, you know, you don't have much protection from accidents, but, um, you know, you do have some protection from theft. And think about it here, when you're stopped in traffic, as you will be, it's very easy for somebody to walk up or maybe ride up on a bicycle, reach in and grab your bag or your purse. So that's why there's this metal grill there that the driver <laughs> kind of locks you in after you've got in. When you get into rural areas, those grills disappear because the traffic is moving faster. So um, the traffic jam that never ends, I think that was a New York Times article uh, title that was written. Uh, Dhaka is trying to deal with its traffic problems They've got a subway system under construction. The government's promised to build 750 miles of new roads around the city, three new ring roads, and six new bus interchanges. Um, last time I was there, the subway system was under construction. And of course, roads were closed or lanes were closed, so the traffic congestion was worse than ever. Dakar, the traffic jam that never ends. Okay, we are going to um, go back to India here and a slightly different topic here. And I kind of want to sort of frame this um, a, a little bit more broadly, the story. So, uh, the kingdom of the Babus. Right? So, in the, you know, one of the legacies of the British, and we can call this a positive or a negative, uh, was the Indian Civil Service, the British, the, in, the East India Company, and later the, the colonial government trained up uh, whole armies of clerks and civil servants to run, uh, uh, to run the country. Um, and so in the colonial era, um, uh, you know, British um, officers head in the colonial uh, civil service, but um, you know it was it became a vast bureaucracy, and I I, I love the contrast here between the two um, quotes here. So this is David Lloyd George, the British Prime Minister in. 1935, talking to the House of Commons. The Indian Civil Service is the steel frame on which the whole structure of our government in India rests. I can't do those upper class accents very well, I'm sorry. Been away, been away a long time. Um, by contrast, uh, uh, India, India's first Prime Minister, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru, said the Indian civil service was neither Indian nor civil nor a service. But despite all of that, he did nothing to disband it. Okay, and since his time, um, you know. Um, oh, every couple of years, there's another blue ribbon commission to reform the civil service and reduce corruption and streamline it. And there's a report to parliament and lots of fine words and nothing happens. So it's estimated, and I think this was... Um, uh, now, this is actually a, f a few years ago, national and state governments um, employed about 14 million civil servants. So that's a couple million more than the population of Greece. Right? Um, and let me explain Babu. It's a kind of, I, I think almost every language has one of these words. Um, I know in Russian it's chinovnik. So this is derived from um, a kind of a South Asian word. It could be Hindu, Urdu, I'm not sure, which means father or grandfather. It's a kind of a familiar term, um, a sign of respect even. But what's happened here is that this has become a term of, what well, shall we say, negative connotations or almost derision to describe 
government bureaucrats. Um, the bureaucracy is the baboodom. Um, and you see one of the cartoons on the right. I love this one, Lord of the Files. <laughs> Um, and I, you know, I, I, it's something that you know, if you travel to India, you will experience. Certainly, if you deal with government departments, but also, as I'm going to tell the story now, in the private sector. So we're in Hyderabad here, and this is the Hyderabad that uh, the city government would love you to see. That's this high-tech, modern centre. Hyderabad, you know, rivals Bangalore in the south of India as a, as a tech centre. Also got a lot of medical services, and so in a city like this, you would think that it would be simple to get your cell phone working, in my case, to get a SIM card. Um, and um, not so. So my, my story begins at the reception desk of the Taj Dekan Hotel, which is the hotel you saw in that uh, first story there. Um, where's the nearest mall? I asked the duty manager. I need to buy a SIM card. Sir, the city centre mall is close by, but I deeply regret to inform you you will not be able to buy a SIM card there. You must go to a mobile provider shop. I didn't bother asking about the marketing logic of restricting SIM card sales to specific outlets, presumably with limited opening hours. OK, please give me the addresses, I said. The manager wrote down three. You could walk, but in this heat I'd advise taking an auto rickshaw, he said. I selected the closest one, Airtel, whose address was listed as Road Number 12, Banjara Hills. It seemed a bit imprecise, but I assumed the driver would know where to go. The duty manager approached me again. Do you have a copy of your passport face page and visa? Also a passport picture, he asked. I really need all that? I answered, but with almost rhetorical resignation. Yes, and you will need a letter from the hotel stating that this is your local address. I'll be pleased to write it. Very obliging. After assembling the paperwork, I set off in an auto rickshaw. Uh, actually, not this one. This is my second or third auto rickshaw on this story. We turned off the main road onto road number 12. After a few minutes, I remembered the manager's remark that I could have walked to the store if the weather had not been so hot. I would not have walked this far even if the temperature had been 20 degrees lower. We were now moving out of the commercial area. I don't think it's this far, I told the driver. Where is it you want, sir? This is road number 12. The Airtel mobile shop. You can buy a recharge at many places. No, I need a SIM card, not a recharge. Please turn around. Eventually we did, and sat in a traffic jam for 15 minutes as we edged slowly back towards the main road. The Airtel store was near the junction. The detour had cost me almost 30 minutes. I joined a line of customers. The sales assistant scrutinized my passport and visa page copies. I was half expecting him to ask me for a notarized copy, but he didn't. His only comment was on the passport picture, which was too large for the box on the registration form. Feel free to cut it down, I told him. I asked when my SIM card would be activated. Sir, tomorrow is a holiday. It will take three days. He could sense my displeasure. But you can go to the Airtel head office and they can activate by this evening. I asked for the address. It was at least reasonably precise. Splendid Towers, they have these wonderful names for office buildings. Splendid Towers near Begum Pet Police Station. Yes, sir, I know it well, said this guy, my next auto rickshaw driver. It turned out that he didn't. We stopped several times on our way across the city so that he could ask for directions and once so he could buy a coconut milk. We got there eventually. I wait for you, sir, he asked. I said no. I had no idea how long the transaction would take. The application form for a SIM card is a page long with many boxes to complete. The sales assistant said he could fill out most of the questions from the information on my passport and visa, but he needed additional data. What is the name of your father, he asked. 
I wondered briefly about questioning the relevance of this item, considering that my father died 30 years ago, but I thought better of it. The assistant was still following instructions, simply following instructions. This is a baboodum. This is the bureaucracy, the Indian bureaucracy, infiltrating the private sector. I also need the names, addresses, and mobile numbers for two people in Hyderabad, he said. I listed the numbers of two colleagues from the University of Hyderabad, but this time I felt justified in asking why their mobile numbers were needed. So we can notify them by text when your SIM card is activated. Why can't you text me on my number? No, sir, we are not allowed to do this. Please inform them they will receive a text. I was about to ask how I was supposed to do this if I did not have a working mobile phone, but I decided to go with the flow. Now you must sign, said the assistant. I signed in three places on the application form and on the copies of the passport and visa. I'd like to buy some time while I'm here, I added. We cannot sell you time until your phone is activated, the assistant replied. Seriously? He did not see the irony. You will go online to Airtel. There you will find some most attractive data packages, he said. Half an hour later, I was back at the hotel. The expedition had taken more than two hours, and all I had to show for it was a 25 rupee, that's worth about 40 cents, SIM card with no credit. I'd spent almost 700 rupees, about $10, on circuitous auto rickshaw rides, but at least collected a few travel notes along the way. Airtel would not accept my credit card. Over dinner, a university colleague said he would add credit and I could pay him back. Later, I received a text saying that 500 rupees had been added, followed by another text saying my credit was under 5 rupees and I could not make any calls or send texts. I gave up and went to bed. The next morning, the credit had been activated. I felt newly empowered. So, uh, you know, I guess that's a pretty good illustration of that first quote that I shared with you from the travel writer Thomas Swick. Travel is only interesting when things go wrong. I actually think I kind of came out ahead on that deal. Sure, it was frustrating, but uh, my goodness me, if I've been able to walk, um, you know, to, uh, to the mall and buy a, buy a SIM card and get credit added immediately, I wouldn't have had anything to write about. So, let me thank you here. Um, I'd be really happy to entertain questions, comments, criticisms, um, hear from you about some of your travel experiences as well. Um, and um, let, let me just say that if you um, in, you know, if you enjoyed tonight, um, Stores Library will be hosting me November the 2nd, first Tuesday in every month. And I, the next two presentations are going to be on Central Asia, which is really where I sort of um, started working and writing. Well, be <laughs> 1995, 1996, a few years after the fall of the Soviet Union. So let me uh, stop my share here. And, yeah. Okay. Thank you, David. Um, I just put in the chat box um, a few different links. And as David mentioned, he is um, doing a series for us uh, the first Tuesday of every month. So November's description is the top link. The registration for November is the second link. And then if you want a list of the whole series, that is the final link. Um, so you can see each month what the topic is. Um, and register if you'd like. Um, you're all also welcome um, to turn on your mics if you have any questions or comments you'd like to share. You're welcome to use the chat box. I'm happy um, to help moderate and um, hear any questions or comments in the chat box. Yep, I see a gentleman has his hand up. Go ahead. Yeah. Hello. It was a very interesting talk. But I want to say that uh, the bureaucracy, current bureaucracy, is a leftover thing from the British. The British bureaucracy was even worse than the current bureaucracy. <laughs> oh, I, 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 I would not. I mean, I didn't live through the British bureaucracy in India, but yeah, I mean, I, I would absolutely accept that. I mean, uh, although you know, 
since independence in 1947, I mean, successive governments, whether they're you know, the Congress Party or the BJP, have, you know, I think both at the national uh, centre and at the state level, uh, they, they've had trouble reducing and, um, you know, streamlining the bureaucracy. So, yeah, so, so I will absolutely agree um, that the, the British uh, take the you know, primary responsibility for creating it. Um, um, you know, independent India has not been able to reform it. I, I mean, what do, what, do you, what do you say to that? <laughs> yeah. Well, I agree. But yeah. uh, <clears throat> now with the digital age, the, some reforms are coming. Bangalore is not as bad as Hyderabad in terms of getting a SIM card. <laughs> okay, well, I'll remember to go to Bangalore next time. Yeah, yeah, that was okay. You haven't been to Bangalore yet? I haven't been to Bangalore. No, I've, tra I've traveled. I've, I, I, I've been in Delhi several times. I've been to the Northeast, to Assam. I've been to uh, Odisha, Odisha, um and um, I've been to Kerala, Tamil Nadu. So, But I have not actually been to Bangalore. You're from Bangalore, sir, are yeah. you? Yes. All right. Okay. Well, I, I I do have friends in Bangalore, and look forward to the opportunity to visit at uh, at, at 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 some point there. And then I will I will test your hypothesis <laughs> about getting a card. <laughs> Every corner store can change you. Give you a yeah. card. <laughs> yeah. That's a, yeah. Yeah. No. I, 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 I. To me, it's uh, you know the the interesting thing about this is you know except the democracy. Uh, what is the relevance of asking for my father's name? You know, I, and, I mean, and I, I found that, I mean, not just in India, I, 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 I've come across that in Nepal and, and Bangladesh as well. It, it's sort of like the, there are these kind of holdover things there. So maybe we should blame the British for that. I guess we can. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but thank you, sir. I mean, I, I guess the, the larger um, question I would sort of raise here is, I mean, and I'm, you know, I found a lot of my Indian friends are very ambivalent about, you know, the British legacy. Can they, you know, uh, Britain, Britain plundered India. The East India Company plundered India. Yeah. Uh, um, I mean, you know, um, you know, Shashi Tharoor recently, you know, uh, you know, raised his thesis. Yet at the same time, they kind of recognize some of the positives there. So it's a it's a really interesting kind of ambivalence that I found amongst my Indian friends and colleagues about uh, the British legacy there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Michael, yes, do you have a comment or a question? Well, hey. You didn't mention the weather in all of your um, travels and um, I always thought that would be one of the first things that would, would be uh, important for people to know if they're planning on going to India. So um, how do you adapt to Indians' um, heat and monsoons and et cetera? I, I'm sorry, Mike, just, just re repeat the last part of your question. How do I? Let me, let me boost my microphone. Yeah. yeah, let me get my wife in here. Um, I have trouble speaking sometimes. Oh, wait, OK. About how you adapt to so, just let me know, um, in all of his... Uh, he didn't talk about the weather. He didn't talk about the weather. Right? He didn't talk about the weather. Oh, I didn't talk about the weather. <laughs> <laughs> talk about monsoons and other all right things. okay yeah all right yeah all right well let, let's talk about the weather shall we um well you know the the mon you know, monsoons obviously are the cause of a lot of flooding which you know you saw in the case of bangladesh and also in india as well i mean uh monsoon uh is 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 kind of a I mean, we think of the monsoon as weather, but actually it's much more than weather. Yes, yeah, certainly it's a weather event, but monsoons, when they happen, and they're happening more unpredictably now. I mean, the last time I was in Bangladesh, the rains came like two months earlier than expected. Um, you know, monsoon really, you know, determines, you know, um, the agricultural season, it determines when you can travel, when you can't travel. And, you know, in places like Madagascar, you know, it will determine, you know, when you get married, when you have children, when you bury your dead and things like that. So, yeah, when we think about monsoon, 
Uh, I mean, monsoon was sort of one unifying theme for the countries that I wrote about there. Uh, but um, and I do explore it a bit more in, in the book. But it it really is much more than simply a, 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 a lot a lot of rain quick a lot of rain quickly so yeah more than more than a weather event something that really does shape society and culture and how how, how people live their lives i also um, mentioned heat how hot it gets it gets to be what 40 degrees heat um, oh boy it, you, you, you yeah you should you should be in doubt uh, well uh, may, maybe mr murphy can uh, speak to this here but i've been in i've been in delhi in july and august and it is absolute the heat is absolutely sapping you know this is why the british had those hill stations that they retreated to so they could sit on the verandas and you know drink tea and gin and tonics and stuff like that just to get out of the you know um get out of the, the cities in the summer um not just the heat the humidity can be really really um um you know, really, 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 really oppressive. Although, by the same token, and I, I sort of find this interesting, you know, weather's a sort of relative thing, okay? So, I was in Delhi once in February, which is kind of winter there, and it's very, quite pleasant, you know, you know, about the temperatures we're having now, maybe a, maybe a little cooler, and you know, everybody there has woolly hats on and jackets, you know, and I'd go into an office and they'd sit me down on, on a chair next to the electric heat. <laughs> it's like, it's like 70 degrees, I'm sort of, I'm dressed like this. It's a, so it's a kind of, it's it's kind of what you're used to you know if you're used to very hot temperatures they don't seem that hot you know and what would seem to us to perhaps to be pleasant temperature are actually kind of chilly mr murthy did you have a comment on yeah. that well you know coming from bangalore bangalore uh, in the olden days meaning 40 or 50 years ago was very pleasant weather throughout the year you know, the the uh, time we had 90 degree weather was maybe about four or five days in a year but now it has, with all the vegetation gone, with all the urbanization and everything, it has become unbearable too. But now we are seeing in Bangalore, we are seeing 100 degree weather for several days yes, in India. Yes, yeah, yeah. And I... but even then, Bangalore is a hill station because it is about 3,500 feet above the sea level. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I yeah, I mean, Population growth. Oops, sorry, it's my home phone going off. Population growth and uh, you know climate change have really had had a, had a devastating have a de devastating impact. And I mean, there will be areas of India and Pakistan and Bangladesh which are not going to be habitable soon simply because of uh, uh, climatic conditions and agricultural traditions. Yeah, very important point. Yeah. Well, I'll have to get to Bangalore before it gets too hot. <laughs> go there in the fall. I will go there. I'll go there in the fall. Yeah, I mean, I, I would. October, November. Right. Okay. Right. Well, thank you. I'll, I will. I will. I will do my best. I just. I just look forward to being able to travel again because, again, India is a country that makes me feel very humble. Okay, I know some, I've traveled some, but the more I travel, the more and talk to people, the more I realize how much more I need to know, how little I know, in fact, you know, so, yeah. Okay. There are very good hotels in Bangalore. All right, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, Becky, do we have, we have some more questions here? Yep. Everyone feel free to turn on your mics or again to enter it into the chat box. I don't have anything else at the moment. So we'll just give people um, just a, a minute to, in case they're typing anything. I don't want to cut anybody off. Um, if there's any final questions or comments, you're welcome to share them. We're having some great conversation. I see someone just turned their mic on. John, did you have a comment or question? Just thank you, David. Very hey John, John, it's wonderful to wonderful to hear you. <laughs> Good to be heard. <laughs> Go ahead. Just thank you. 
Oh, all right, good. Well, well, well thank you, and it's 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 it, it's it's ni ni nice to reconnect. Good, and uh, hope you may join me for future ones for 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 Stores Library. This is a, one of the beauties of. Um, I mean, there's many bad things about you know um, such connections here, but the good thing here is that you know potentially Stores Library in Southern Massachusetts can get uh, people from all over the United States and even further afield involved. So that's 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 uh, one one small benefit of Zoom presentations. It is, and I'm in North Carolina, and. Uh... I noticed that you had a, a program called 1947. Is that available anymore or is that gone to um, the ether? I've, I've given that a couple of times, 1947, the year of conflict, where I, I, I do look at partition in India and I look at uh, um, actually the, you know, kind of the revolutionary movement in Indonesia and also rebellion in Madagascar. I don't think anybody's recorded that, uh, but I'd be happy to gi give it again. Now, if you want to, if you want to call at me a local library, okay, and uh, I mean, these are, free, these are free presentations, you know, so um, if, if with with a few of my other presentations, there are recordings I could share. But 1947, the year of conflict, I, I did it actually for stores. Uh, oh, actually, you you recorded it, didn't you? Yes, I, w I just went and looked and, and got the link. I'm uh, putting it in the chat box right now. So right, well, the, well, there you go. That's the that's the answer to the question. We have. A, we're well, thank you. <laughs> All right, good, excellent. All right, yeah, that's probably the the heaviest presentation, you know, the more most historical. But um, um, you know, but uh, I think it, I think I think I think it's solid. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Thank. I. I. I yeah. I'd forgotten you'd been recording. Thank you, Stores, for recording. Yes. <laughs> we make everything available here. Great. Good. It looks like Vicky turned on her mic and maybe was starting to say something. Vicky, did you have a comment or question before we wrap up? Yes, hello, David. I wanted to tell you how nice it is to hear your your stories again and to see your face. Oh. And I got to hear you in person in West Virginia, and it's great to, to listen to you from California. Uh, very nice, very interesting. Well, I'm good, your good. Book. Well, good, Vicky. Thank you so much. Give my, give my best to Alex. Yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> and real. This is kind of social time as well for me. <laughs> I think it's great. I think it's great too. And say yeah. hi to everybody there for me. I, I, I will. I will do that. And let us know if you're getting back to Charleston anytime soon. Okay. Will do. Will do. Thanks, Vicky. Thank you. Uh, in the chat box. Um, so I just want to thank everybody again for joining us tonight. Thanks you to David for this presentation. I hope uh, you'll consider joining us for um, some more of the Accidental Travel Writer series. Um, again, the link is in the chat box. I'll also send that along with the video recording, which I will send to all of you once it's ready for this program. Um, so thank you. I hope you have a great night and to see you again soon. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Great. Thank um, you. Yep, Bye. Stay, yeah. stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.